semiconductors. Uh, and semiconductors, they're called semiconductors because as you raise the temperature, they become conductors. Right? So let me give you the outline a little bit. So today, Polarization, then. We're, we're talking about the dipole moment. So, so the idea of dielectrics then is either you induce a dipole moment in your system or you already have it, right? And so then there are two ways in which we can approach polarizability. And so let me go back to the conducting sphere in the presence of an electric field. So we have, we had a conducting sphere, if you recall, and we had an electric field. And this sphere was grounded. So the radius of the sphere for guys is that we come up with for this sphere is equal to minus dc r plus d0 aq over r squared cosine. That's what the potential is. And this is part of problem uh, 5.11. So we identify what the potential is of the dipole, so E of R and beta can be written as some dipole moment times R hat, right? Divided by 4 pi and 4 zero R squared. So then if we compare these two things, so this is the potential due to a dipole, then I can imagine that this I can write as E external. R of theta, but D induce as a function of R. And the D external was basically my E field that I have. So E was equal to D0 to the K hat version. So then that is this term. So this term is the external potential. So then this is the external one. And here I have. So if I look at, at this, then I can identify, I can say that this is equal to some P0 cosine theta over 4 pi and 4 zero R squared. So if I compare now the induced one with respect to uh, what the potential is due to a dipole, then I can immediately see that for that sphere, I can then have the P0 comparing this two, right? get that P0 can be written as 4 pi x to 0 
So in some sense, this is an induced dipole. So if you didn't have an electric field E, you would not have a dipole in use of this system. Right? So this, this is an induced dipole. So I can write this as P, then I can write in general as being alpha times E, right? And this alpha, then, let me write it again here. And so alpha is a bit for visibility. And so we have molecular permissibility model, we have atomic permissibilities, and so on, and there are different values, but the, the point is, is that they, they are proportional to E. If I didn't have an electric field E, I wouldn't have a dipole moment at all. So for that sphere, if I compare these two numbers, alpha, this is what you have to do with that problem, by 11 to 4 pi epsilon zero times K Q. So then I discussed this uh, a little bit with you last time, which I said that Faraday looked at then a capacitor and that had a dielectric material in the middle, and then he understood that, well, I have to reduce electric field in size, so I'm going to imagine that I have a tiny amount of little spheres, right, that made this material, that the spheres are conducting spheres, and in between that sphere and another sphere, because of course you cannot uh, you know, make everything filled by spheres, there's going to be volume between the spheres, right, as they touch, say. That he thought it was something that was non-conducting. So he had conducting a sphere, tiny little ones, embedded inside a medium that was not conducting. And what I said to you is that if you go through that calculation, you come up with some value of the volume. If you, if you look at this A cube in here, it's in some sense is the radius of that sphere, and the volume of that sphere would be 4 pi over 3 A cube. So in the book, if, if um, you might have to read this a few times, there's a lot of stuff in there that comes from different areas of physics, including quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics. So they have a table 6.1 in which they list for you what the atomic abilities are, and they list them in terms of alpha over 4 pi epsilon 0. So they, instead of having 4 pi epsilon 0 here, remember 4 pi epsilon 0 is equal to pi times n to the 9. That's what uh, that is. So these different units. So I can express this in any units of energy. So I can have that this is equal to 9 times 10 to the 9 joules, right? Meters over Coulomb squared, right? And joule is, of course, a Newton meter. And I can also write this as 9 times 10 to the 9 joules meter cube over Coulomb meter quantity squared. I can write you know, various forms of these constants. The point is, is what they want to do is to write this uh, A cube. So if you list now alpha over 4 pi epsilon 0, this will have units of volume. And they list a few of them in there. They have hydrogen, they have lithium, sodium, potassium, and so on. In that table 6.1, I don't want to write it, but the units are of the order of 10 to the minus 30 cubic meters, right? And 10 to the minus 30 cubic meters is 10 to the 1 Armstrong's cube, right? So if I can write 1 Armstrong's cube is equal to 10 to the minus 30 cubic meters. And we measure atomic radii in Armstrong's. We don't do it in meters, that's a huge unit. And so the size of a hydrogen atom is about 0 0.5 Armstrong's. And that's a more radius, so this of bore is what it is, right? So then if you look at all of these units, they're in some sense are measuring the size of the atom. And so there are two differences there that you have to know. One of them is on the column on the left hand side, you have the hydrogen, lithium, sodium, potassium, and so on. And on the right hand side, you have heat, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon, which are what we call noble gases. And why we call them noble gases is because we have the shell structure of how electrons actually occupy the levels in quantum mechanics. And you can have basically an electron is basically a fermion, so you can have a spin up or down. And so for each level of angular momentum, you can have two states, right? So when you have angular momentum L equal to zero, then you can have two electrons occupying that L equal zero state. So that is called the one S state. Right, and the S has to do with the 
German actually comes from sharp and you know, if you use uh, bottom deck plus. So they have all these levels. So you have L equals to zero is the S state. P equals, uh, the P state is L equals to one, right? The D state is the L equals to two and so on. So you have to look at how many states that I have and the number of states that I have is two L plus one times two. So if L is equal to zero, I have two because of the spin up or down. If I have L equals to one, then I will have two L plus one is three times two is six. So I can have six electrons, right? So the levels are occupied, the number of electrons that I have have to be equal to the number of protons that I have inside the nucleus to have the atom that is neutral. But when you get to the level in which you have, say, helium has two electrons on the outside, it's inert because it cannot react with anything. It doesn't need an extra electron to fill that band and so on. On the other side of the spectrum, I have the metals that have only one electron extra in the outside. So you have, an, say, 1s2 uh, and a p electron. So that basically means, <coughs> say, sodium or, or potassium and so on. If you lose that electron, that I, if I gain an electron, excuse me, I, I close my shell completely and then I become uh, neutral, right? So uh, those electrons then are loosely bound and that's why these things are conductors, right? They have an electron on the outside that is not bound. In other words, you have your filled shell and then you have you put one more electron on it. And so this is the first electron that you have above a filled shell. So obviously it's not going to be, uh, it's gonna be uh, easy to ionize the material. And so for those, you can see that the polarizability is quite large. Like for potassium, it's 43 Armstrong's cube. For sodium, it's 23.6, and so on. So these numbers are pretty large. On the other hand, on the size of the helium atom, and neon, and orphan colonies, the polarizabilities are rather small. They're 1.42 Armstrong's cube, and so on. And that's because we cannot change the shape of that electron cloud very easily. They are spherically symmetrical. It's a sphere, completely sphere. Right? So this is how to do with these L states that I'm talking about. So how do we maintain an atom? At an atomic level, the book tells you that I have to actually use the Schrodinger equation and apply basically to the Coulomb interaction between the electron and the proton. I have to apply an electric field. That problem is done actually at the second level, the second semester in quantum mechanics here, and it's called the spark effect. The start effect is you look at a change in energy level due to an external electric field. When you actually look at the problem with the uh, magnetic field, that's called the Zeeman effect. And actually, we do experiments with the Zeeman effect, which is this good. So, if you do that correctly, then uh, they give you a formula for what the polarizability will be, which is not this number. It's not this formula that we have here, this alpha that I have. Okay? Four pi epsilon zero a cube. So if you see classically, classically, right, alpha over four pi epsilon zero, which is what I have there. So if I put alpha over four pi epsilon zero, then this is going to be equal to a cube, and this is classical. Classical means because of the problem with the with the conductor, right? If we do quantum mechanics on the other hand, then you get a number that it is nine half a a cube. Right, which is that number that you have here. So for the hydrogen atom, alpha is equal to nine and a half the Bohr radius. So the Bohr radius is the size of you know the electrons spinning around this way. So in general, though, I'm going to have atomic polarizabilities. So I have say a nucleus and I have a cloud of an electron spinning around. And so this remember is a diffuse sort of pattern that depends on the L state. So if you have an L equals zero state, that cloud is mostly spherical, right? The angular momentum is zero. If I have an L equals to one, then it's elongated and it have a node in the middle and so on. So because you have electrons that have different L states, then it's a superposition of L equals zero, L equals one, L equals two for the atom, right? So that's the electron cloud that I have all the electrons. So when I apply an electric field What happens now is, is that if I were to remove this nucleus from here, and I just look at the electron cloud, that would be like the problems we've got when we have a continuous charge distribution, right? So you have basically 
all of these will be by negative charge. And of this will be the location of the positive charge, right? So the, if I then calculate what the center of charge is, which is like center mass, right? Then it will be in the center of this thing. And so it will overlap with the nucleus, right? So there will be no separation between the center charge of the electron cloud and the proton where we have the proton. So now when I apply an electric field to this, this cloud gets stored. The electrons that tend to get away from wherever I have this, which was positive, right? So if in this case, if you apply an electric field like this, the electron cloud will move down, and so then you, you will end up with a state that will look like, and this is a very a schematic sort of picture, but you end up with a state that sort of look elongated, in which now the center of mass may, maybe is here, but the proton is over here. Okay, so this will be the negative, and this is the plus. Okay? And that se separation, let's call it X, is basically then what gives me the dipole, induced dipole model of the polarizability. So if I multiply this by the net charge Q of the system that I have, then this will, should be proportional to, to the polarization field. So let's call this a zero, this is be zero, okay? And so there is a very simple model that was cooked up uh, a long time ago at the beginning of the 1900s, which has to do with how do you describe the motion of this electron. And so if the electron is bound to the atom, the first thing that you did is undergo some kind of harmonic motion. So it had to be like a harmonic oscillator. So this model says, okay, so I have the mass times the, and let's imagine that this is a 1D model, right? Plus K times X, then it will have to be equal to Q times electric field that I have. And this is a 1D problem. So I have a 3D problem, I have to put a vector here, a vector here, and then a vector here, right? So then if I divide the whole thing by the mass, what I get is, is that I have that the acceleration, uh, so omega zero function is squared times x to be equal to q over m times e. So that's the field. So for a minute, so this is a simple model in which this is how bound this electron is to your system. So omega zero squared is equal to some this k over m in this case. Of course, we, this is a classical picture. So you have to think of omega zero as atomic vibrations, right? And the electric field might not be what I call the EC field, a director of field, but you can imagine that E field can have a frequency component is E to the atom So the E field can change in frequency. So then if I do this, then I this implies then that what we call this, this is part of what we call the uh, linear response, I get that X as a function of time to draw as X zero E to the I omega T. So if I put that, so if I put that back in that equation, then I get that minus omega squared x e to the x zero e to the i omega t plus omega zero squared x e to the i omega t is equal to q over m e zero e to the i omega t. So then you can express x zero here as being equal then to if you can see q over m e zero divided by omega zero squared minus omega squared. That's what I have for x zero, right? And so then the, the dipole moment that I can have that I see through should be q times x zero. So this is then equal to q squared e zero divided by m omega zero squared minus <coughs> So if I have a static field, meaning a field that doesn't change with frequency, so if you have an AC field, that omega is a frequency with which the current changes or electric field changes, so in the limit then of omega going to zero, then I get E goes to E zero. So I get basically this problem. Right? You apply an E field, and this E field was not changing with time, it was just constant. Right? That's what we have. So also you can imagine that the, the, the analog that you say, well, this omega of the field is a frequency, say that it's in the terahertz, it doesn't matter. The frequency, the original frequency of the atom, the electrons in the atom is gonna be a lot higher, right? Because it's in the EVs. 
So you can imagine that this omega zero represents in some sense the binding energy of the electrons in the atom. So if I multiply by h bar, which is Planck's constant, I will get an energy. And that energy is, should be the binding energy of the electron for the atom. Then on the ionization energy. So those energies are the A and the E Vs, so that is very, very high. And so I don't expect this to be uh, omega zero. So then this in this limit then this P should go to Q squared D zero over M omega zero squared. Okay? So then now you can see again that even in this case of the atomic polisability, the P that I have depends on D zero. So if I have zero field, the polarizability is also, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, the, the dipole moment, the loose dipole moment should be here. In general, since I have more than one frequency in a, in a molecule or something like that, I expect, in this case, alpha to be equal to the sum of the modes that I have of Q sub i times the square divided by n sub i omega plus <coughs> all this omega i. This is what in fact is. So if I have, you know, a molecule, or I have a complex, uh, 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 different frequencies of different states in an atom, then I can come up with this system. I have to make one comment on this, that this model basically is very simple, but it applies to the limit in which the local electric fields in your system is very small, or you don't need to add it, because electric field on an atom C is clearly has to do with the fluctuation in the electric field by atoms nearby, right? Because of the, the Coulomb interaction, the matter of protons and electrons, right? So then this electric field that I'm applying is the one that I applied, so I'm ignoring the electric field produced by the local uh, atoms around that one. And so this is also a low density limit, so a density in which they, the atoms basically are far away, so it's sort of like a gas, if you can imagine. Okay, so then I get a polarizability alpha that is given by this, the proportional to Here, uh, I got that this was proportional to a q, this alpha that I have here, okay? So here, it's different. It depends basically on some kind of binding energy of the electrons. Right? Okay, so um, let's go to the polar molecule. So this, this is the case in which the atom itself did not have a dipole moment before I applied the electron. That moment was zero, right? Now, in the book, they tell you that once you apply an electric field, you develop a polarizability, right? And so they tell you, oh, in order to treat that, I have to use quantum mechanics, right? And so they write a formula for the Schrodinger equation in which you have added an energy term that depends on the interaction of the electric field with that electron. You disregard the interaction with the proton of the hydrogen atom. That's the simplest case you can treat. And I said that this is what we do in the second semester of quantum mechanics when we look at what we call the Stark effect, right? Now, what happens when you have more than one electron? So the hydrogen atom is the case that they treated there in the book, in that formula. So it does become a very complicated problem, right? So we, we can still use uh, Schrodinger equation to solve it because it's, 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 a, it's a problem today that can be solved computationally speaking, and, and you have orbitals and all that you can describe it. Well, this is another de description. This is what I'm saying. In both cases, you end up with some polarizability that uh, has uh, some quantity associated with it. In the case of the classical thing, this is proportional to the size of the atom. It still will be proportional to that. But so the dipole moment that is induced is proportional to, linearly proportional to the electron. Okay, so now let's go on to polar moment. So the other case that we have is this case now of polar molecules. So they list different molecules, right? And we don't have that for graphs. So you have now a dipole moment that it is permanent. Okay, here is induced. In other words, I have a P that if I apply an E field, I acquire a dipole moment, right? But what happens in systems in which you already have a dipole moment, okay? So this is this scale of polar molecules where you basically now have a configuration, and they list several ones here. Water is one of them, methane, uh, uh, 
hydrochloride, uh, they can list a bunch of them in there, okay? And so these now have a permanent dipole moment. But the point is, is that if you look at this like water, say they have water molecules, they're moving around all the time. So it's not a gas, it's a liquid, but they're moving around. And when they move around, the molecule, you can think of some oxygen, we call this sort of like, you know, uh, the Disney sort of thing. So this is the hydrogen, this is the hydrogen, and this is the oxygen. And so now you have a dipole moment here that, that points almost to the middle of this, and as the molecule rotates and so on, this dipole moment points in different orientations. So when I look at a sample now, a tiny sample, I will have dipole moments that point in different orientations, right? So what I'm pointing at here is the, the vectorial sum. So when I sum vectorially, so what is now the uh, uh, average dipole moment, then this would be equal to 1 over n sum i equals 1 to n if I have n of these of pi vector. So if you think of n as being a huge number, of 10 to the 23rd or something like that, then uh, the fact that these more or less have all the same value, but they point in for uh, randomly in different orientations, the addition of this gives you zero, the vector addition, because you know some of them will be in the negative direction or positive, so then this goes to zero, right? And n is very large. And so you do not have a dipole moment there that you can measure. You don't have what we call a polarization. So then there are two terms in there, and I go through this a little bit in the book. They just give you a formula. I'm going to give you a little bit of background in, in this. Is that you have now agitation. This thing. You can think of a temperature being the thing that gives give, give rise to the agitation, right? That makes the thing disorder. So as you lower the temperature, then the system will tend to react as long as I have an electric field. So if I apply an electric field to this system, again, like this, there is an interaction energy of each one of these dipoles, which is equal to minus P dotted into the electric field E. Right? And that would tend to align this with the electric field. So on the average, right? And so then this electric field will tend to align. And then the temperature will tend to misalign. So if I have these, these two cases, and they are competing cases. So what I'm going to do now is, is uh, uh, a few steps in calculating then the average dipole moment per unit volume, given that you have uh, electric field present and some temperature T that tends to misalign them. And I'm going to use this U for that sort of thing. This is what they do in the book. So what do we need to think about this once you have uh, some kind of agitation, what you want to ask the question is, is that since the, I, I think, I, I want to evaluate what the average dipole moment is per unit volume. And I, this average is average over what? Over all of them in the presence of temperature. So if the temperature is constant in this case, then I get what I call the canonical ensemble. And so what I want to calculate is the probability that I have one dipole aligned between theta and theta plus d theta. What is that probability, okay? So the, what is the probability that if you were to do a measurement, you will see the dipoles oriented between theta and theta plus d theta. And so that has to depend, since we're dealing with the canonical distribution, so I'm gonna write this in this form. So imagine, now I have my dipole here, this is, case it's theta and the projection of this on the axis this is phi okay so then this is that that projection onto that axis and so then I'm going to have this this is y phi so I'm looking now at the at this and so I want to calculate the probability this is not polarization that I'm oriented between theta and theta plus d theta. And that probability is given by now e to the uh, minus u over k Boltzmann t divided by what we call t, the partition. 
distribution function. So what is Z? Z here, since this is a continuous distribution, is an integral, and this is D of omega. Okay? It's equal to E to the minus U of T, D of omega. So that will give me the probability that I align myself between theta and theta plus D theta. In the book, they just write this out. Okay? So then once I have a probability of aligning between theta and d theta, then I want to calculate the average light bulb moment in that direction. So now to do an average p, light bulb moment average, then I will have to do the, the average that I'll have to integrate over all of these pro, uh, the probability distribution. So I have to do that this is equal to p, so I have a vector here, right? Well, p to the minus u over k volts by t, d of omega divided by, so that will be my average line. So now, how do you have to, how would you think about it, and I know that some of you have also taken this uh, approach in a statistical mechanics, but we have what we call distributions. So you have a canonical distribution, which basically means that what basically drives that is the temperature is constant. You can have a microcanonical distribution, which the energy is constant. You can have a grand canonical distribution which both the temperature and the pressure are constant, right? So there are different distributions that have different weightings depending on what you average over, because what we see are average quantities always when we measure them over the distribution. So this is just a, a straight from a statistic. So here, this is some kind of probability or some kind of distribution, right? right. So when you are going to ask for somebody what is the average height of a male between this age and this age in the United States, what do you have to do? have to then have some kind of sampling. You don't want to do this for everybody in the United States. You have to do a sampling, right? An accurate sampling, all right? And then imagine that for some reason you're in San Francisco, and in San Francisco you have a very large Asian population, and I'm not discriminating anybody, but imagine that the Asian population have a different height distribution. So then if you use the same probability that you mentioned before, you're going to get it wrong, because there, the makeup of the population is different than the one that you assume. It was everywhere the same, right? So then that is why we have to do these weighting averages. And in some sense, this is weighted by the probability of having this energy U that depends on the direction of the dipole. In some sense, when you might say, what is the probability of finding a dipole between an angle of theta plus d theta, what I'm asking is, what is the probability or having the energy, because the energy, of course, is weighted by KT of the dipole, right, that has that angle. So then this is equal then to minus P E cosine of the angle, right? So if in some sense the dipole orientation did not depend on the angle at all, right, then this probability would be one. Because obviously this E is this quantity, and when I average over here, this is constant, I have to pull this out, right? And then I don't get anything. You see what I mean? So when I look at PC in this case, this is a vector. So when I look at PC, I have to put PC here. This was a vector before, right? So then if this does not depend on angle, I can pull it out, and this you can see that the top is just the same as the bottom is one. So it's, there is no weighting. I don't have to weight it by the angle. The energy does not depend on the angle. But in this case, it does. So then I have to do this integral. So how do we do the integral? We'll do this sort of fast. So I have u here, and u is this p e cosine of theta, okay? And p c here, I'm gonna write this as p e cosine of theta. And what is this d of omega p? Well, d of omega p, I'm gonna write as d cosine theta d theta. That's what it would be, right? So when I make the P here, I mean in the direction of dipoles, and I take it to the Z direction to be that direction that I'm averaging over. So you can see that now when I look at the average P sub C, I really have to do an integral, and I'm going to change the directions here between minus one and one, and between zero and two pi, but what I'm going to call this is du, or now I have u e to the minus e to the plus alpha u divided by the integral from 0 to pi of the phi, the integral minus 1 to 1 of the u of e to the alpha u. Alpha for me is going to be equal to d0 e over k volts minus t 
and they are half about E0. But how about you? So my Z, in some sense, what is that equal to? This is this quantity, right? It's equal to 2 pi, the integral from minus 1 to 1, of e to the alpha u du, and this is equal to 2 pi over alpha e to the alpha minus e to the minus alpha, right? So this is equal to 2 pi over 4 pi sin over alpha times its hyperbolic sinh of alpha. This is z. Okay? So now, what about the top? So this is the integral over d phi here. So I have now the integral p, I can write as 2 pi over 4 pi over alpha sinh of alpha times the integral from minus 1 to 1 of u p to the alpha. And if you look at that integral, u e to the alpha u, that you don't have to do that integral. You already got it in the first one, right? Because z is a function here of alpha, and that is equal to, like I wrote over there, I can write this integral as 2 pi, the integral from minus 1 to 1 of e to the alpha u. So that's what c does. So now the integral of u e to the alpha u u, I can write as e to the alpha of the integral from minus one to one of e to the alpha u. That's a trick we use, right? So you take the derivative with respect not the integral variable but the other parameter that I have in there, and that will bring a u down, right? Which is here, right? And that's what it is. So I'm not going to do the integral. I just take the derivative of my z. So then this in here, I can write in the two I'm going to cancel, right? And so I'm going to get that this is equal to alpha over 2 uh, e over d to the alpha times 2 pi of um, 1 over alpha sinh of alpha divided by, and now I'm going to have uh, here the same thing. On your z, is that a 4 pi or a u? I'm sorry, I think that's not good. What about that? The z? I can write that a bit. Where it says z equals? No, no, no. no. Where, where you were, just right above it. Here? Yeah, sure. that. Yeah. 4 pi or l? No, right under it. Z. Z is 4 pi over 4 pi. So that's the multiplier divided by 2. And so at the bottom I get 4 pi over alpha sinh of alpha. So what is the top one? So the, the 4 pi is obviously are going to cancel. I'm going to get that this is equal to minus 1 over alpha squared sinh of alpha plus. Uh, the cosh of alpha, right, because I have to take this integral divided by alpha over, and this is a 4 pi cancel, over 1 over alpha sinh of alpha. And remember, there was a p0 in front of all these things. So then, uh, let me put this up on top here. So let me write it over here. So p average now is going to be equal to p0. And now, when I integrate this, this is cosh over sinh, which is the hyperbolic tangent of alpha. This is minus 1 over alpha squared sinh of alpha over 1 over alpha. This is minus 1 over alpha. And again, alpha here is p0e over k Wolfram. So then I get what is called a Langevin function. So now I can write that the p average is equal to p0 times the Langevin function, which depends on this alpha. And the Langevin function then will be equal to cotangent of alpha minus 1 over alpha. And alpha 
alpha t is d0 d over k1 plus d. So then if I were to plot this, and this is there is a plot in the book about this, what you get is something that <coughs> looks like this. So here you have this is plus one, here you have minus one, and this is alpha. So uh, basically, as the temperature increases, this goes to zero, so this is zero, and so the dipole moves is zero, and as you increase the temperature, then you get a value of a saturation that the most you can do as you increase the electric field or you reduce the temperature is that you align everything, right? So then when this is equal to plus one, what that basically means is, is that all the dipoles inside the system are aligned so this is the maximum that you can, you can get. So this is corresponds to D equal to D0. Right? Obviously, what I want to evaluate is not P, because we don't measure the dipole moment like that. We measure the polarization, which is the dipole moment per unit volume. Right? So uh, the, in some sense, I know the number of dipoles that I have, because I know the number of atoms or molecules that I have per unit volume, because I have the density. right? So in some sense, by measuring the density of uh, my system, or knowing the density of the system, then I know the polarization, because that depends on the number of dipoles that I have per unit volume, which of course depends on the density. Now, what happens with K. Boltzmann T? So K. Boltzmann, yes, uh, like I said, there is a lot in this book. K. Boltzmann is 8.617 to the 10 to the minus 5 PV degree Kelvin. So when you are at 300K, at more or less room temperature, then K Boltzmann T <coughs> is equal to 0 0.025. It's about that. Okay. 25 milliseconds. So what are the polarizations that I have, and what is the dependence on the electric field? So what we have is, is that I need to expand the cotangent of alpha for alpha small. So for alpha much less than one, now, the hyperbolic tangent of alpha is equal to one over alpha plus, let me put the expansion of the, the third term, one, one over alpha plus alpha over three minus alpha cubed over 45 plus, and so it goes from then on, it goes in odd powers. Alpha cube, alpha fifth, alpha seven. So this is what it is. So that basically means that my average p then should go as p zero times <coughs> one over alpha plus alpha cube minus one over alpha. So it should go as p zero over three times alpha. So what is alpha? Well, alpha we just keep writing this p zero e over. So then this is equal then to p zero plus the square over 3 k Boltzmann t times t0, right? This is what I have. So I multiply p0 by this p0 that I have, and I get p0 squared. Then I have k Boltzmann t. There is a 3 coming from this. This is what it is. And so this implies that the polarizability alpha then is equal to, or I should call it alpha 